If you are struggling with severe sulfur sensitivity like I am, in this video you will learn how candida might be holding you back. The potential link between sulfur sensitivity and candida overgrowth is a connection that I would bet most functional medicine doctors are not aware of. After I treated hydrogen sulfide SIBO, I was able to add in molybdenum and other supplements and sulfur foods, including even some steak. And then eventually I was even able to reduce the amount of molybdenum I was taking. And then all of a sudden I plateaued and then I lost almost all of the ground that I had gained, leaving me with six foods. I also started to need even more molybdenum than I had ever needed. None of this made sense to me until I came across three sentences in a book called The Devil Wears Prada. Just kidding. It's called The Devil is in the Garlic. Terrible joke. Sorry. If you have sulfur sensitivity issues, you might already be familiar with this book by naturopathic Dr. Greg Nye. In it, he has a lot of great information like how sulfur is processed in the body and how to manage sulfur sensitivity. Now, I respectfully disagree with <laughs> I do respect, respectfully disagree with him that hydrogen sulfide SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is an adaptation to provide the body with sulfate. Don't come for me in the comments. Don't come for me unless I send for you. Even naturopathic Dr. Allison Seebecker, who wrote an accolade on the first page of his book, said that she has some different thoughts about hydrogen sulfide SIBO and I agree with her. But today I'm here to talk to you about CFO, and I came across the connection between sulfur sensitivity and CFO or candida, which is the main type of yeast that causes CFO, in Greg Nye's book on page 40. And if you have a Kindle version of this book, I don't know what page it's on. <laughs> so he talks about how candida produces aldehydes. Let me get the book that I threw. <laughs> there are only three sentences here, but it's also... It's also the one page that has fallen out of this book. They don't make books like they used to, says my mom. But one of my strong suits is taking a little nugget of an idea and doing a deep dive in the literature and reading a lot and coming to a light bulb moment of what is going on in my body. So what is an aldehyde? Well, it's a compound that looks like this and that's all you gotta know and you don't even have to remember this. You've probably at least heard of formaldehyde and that's an example of an aldehyde. Dr. Nye says that aldehydes have to be processed by an enzyme that requires molybdenum to work. If you have sulfur sensitivity, you probably know that many patients benefit greatly from molybdenum, which is an essential trace mineral that all humans need for enzymes and metabolic processes to work, and they get it from their diet. In Dr. Nye's clinical experience, he has seen the best results with the brand of molybdenum from Biotics Research, and this is the brand I use as well, and it has quite literally saved my life and allowed me to add in sulfur foods, and humans need sulfur to live. So Dr. Nye's book says that the molybdenum-dependent enzyme that breaks down aldehydes is called ALDH, which stands for aldehyde dehydrogenase. But actually, and I'm no expert in biochemistry, but I couldn't find any evidence that this enzyme needs molybdenum to work. However, I did find on the website for the Linus Pauling Institute at Oregon State University, which is a great resource, by the way, that there are four molybdenum-dependent enzymes in the human body, sulfite oxidase, xanthine oxidase, aldehyde oxidase, and another one we're not going to talk about because that enzyme is canceled. Just kidding. It, it just has nothing to do with what we're talking about. I've talked about sulfite oxidase in previous videos, but in short, it is the enzyme that breaks down sulfite into sulfate so that it can be eliminated from the body. And sulfite, the, the buildup of that in the body is what contributes to a lot of uncomfortable symptoms of sulfur sensitivity. But today I want to focus on xanthine oxidase and aldehyde oxidase. These enzymes do a lot in the human body, but I want to focus on the fact that they both break down aldehydes. And it's important to note that aldehyde oxidase is different from aldehyde dehydrogenase, and that's the one that's mentioned in the book. 
actually, when you go to the Wikipedia pages of both of those enzymes, at the very top it says not to be confused with the other one, which is actually what I was doing. I was confusing them together for about three hours of researching for this video. When we drink alcohol, our body breaks it down into acetaldehyde, which is what contributes to the feeling of a hangover, according to some scientists. And they added that some scientists think because other scientists think it might be due to the buildup of acetate. So I wanted to say that so someone commenting wouldn't be like, oh, it's not going to be acetate. Fun fact, candida overgrowth has actually been known to cause what is called autobrewery syndrome. This happens when the yeast in the digestive tract ferments the carbohydrates that you eat and creates alcohol enough to raise your blood alcohol level to make you drunk. And you can get a DUI. I got a hangover, whoa, I got an empty cup, pour me some more, and I can drink until I throw up, Hey. So in addition to alcohol, candida also create acetaldehyde as a byproduct. Acetaldehyde is a nasty substance. It's carcinogenic, which means it can cause cancer, and it is key in the creation of biofilms by candida. And biofilms are slimy substances that microbes produce to protect themselves, often from the host's immune system. So how does this relate to sulfur sensitivity? We're finally getting there. Well, if you have an overgrowth of candida in your small intestine, this means that they're creating a lot of acetaldehyde, which has to be broken down by xanthine oxidase and aldehyde oxidase, in addition to other enzymes probably. So these two enzymes need molybdenum to work, just like the sulfite oxidase enzyme that breaks down sulfites. And this is when it all clicked for me. After I treated the hydrogen sulfide SIBO, I was able to add in molybdenum and sulfur containing foods after being living on only five low sulfur vegetables for 10 months. And as I said, I was even able to add back steak, which is one of the highest containing sulfur foods, sulfur containing foods. But then seemingly out of nowhere, as I said earlier, I plateaued, regressed, and I was like, oh no, maybe the hydrogen sulfide SIBO is coming back. So I redid the Trio Smart Breath test and everything came back negative. So then why did I need so much molybdenum for a low sulfur diet? Something changed. I kept saying to myself, what changed, what changed, what changed? And what most likely happened is the combination of my slow motility in the small intestine and my antibiotic use made me prone to developing SIFO. We don't know a whole lot about SIFO, but what we do know is that those are the two main risk factors. And with all the aldehydes that the candida are creating, my body has to break that down and that requires molybdenum. No longer did my body need as much molybdenum to break down sulfites from having hydrogen sulfide SIBO, but now my body had swung to needed, needing molybdenum to break down all the aldehydes from the candida. It's a game of whack-a-mole. And I still need molybdenum to break down sulfur containing foods just like any healthy person, but now my body needs more molybdenum because the enzymes that break down the aldehydes is hogging all the molybdenum. So I'm still having trouble with sulfur containing foods. So how do we fix this problem? Well, obviously I have to treat the SIFO. I don't need complete eradication because candida is part of the normal flora in most people, but I do need to bring that fungal load down and I will still use molybdenum, obviously. Beyond that, xanthine oxidase and aldehyde oxidase both need riboflavin or B2 to work, so I'm taking that. And just as a side note, they also need iron and sulfur to work. And as I said before, aldehyde dehydrogenase does not require molybdenum to work as far as I know. But circling back around to why aldehyde dehydrogenase is probably important in those with candida is because it does break down acetaldehyde. And you probably want this enzyme working as optimally as possible. This enzyme requires NAD, which is available as a supplement. And when I think of acetaldehyde and alcohol, I think of the liver. When you have an overgrowth of microbes in the GI tract, that means they're creating a lot of toxic byproducts that have to be filtered out by your liver. A great liver detoxification supplement for those who are sulfur sensitive is called calcium deglucurate, which I affectionately call CDG. And calcium deglucurate aids in glucuronidation, which is just one pathway of several in phase two liver detoxification. And in my thorough research, I discovered that aldehyde dehydrogenase also creates deglucurate. 
And if ALDH is overworked by breaking down aldehydes created by candida, I can speculate that calcium deglucurate will aid in liver detoxification. I know that it has been a lifesaver for me while treating SIFO. Over the past two years of dealing with sulfur sensitivity, SIBO, and SIFO, I've learned a lot and created videos all along the way, so I've made a curated playlist just for you of my best videos on this topic. Piper and I will see you over there, fellow health-seeking humans. Click it. You better click it before I start singing hangover again. I got a hangover. Whoa. I got an empty cup. Pour me some more.